So I've been dropping some shorts from the question and answer Friday that I thought went particularly well. And then I caught, because another person in the corner mentioned this video, how fa um, this video with uh, Chris from Waves of Obsession and Neil and Chad. Neil and Chad are doing these interviews with people. It's a long interview. There's a lot of interesting stuff in it, but this part caught my salience landscaper as the Grim Grizz says. So what did you have in your mind, Chris, in regard to Brabakey and uh, McGilchrist? Gilchrist? And mm. uh, just thinking about the two hemispheres and, uh, and the language. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, well, whatever. I'll just, you know, tell you everything that I've been kind of working. Now, I just did the Miley Cyrus video which I wasn't planning on doing. It just came up and I had the idea and I was sitting in my office and I had them in it and so I did it. And I thought about Chris because Chris um, also talked about, earlier in this video, talked about the divorce of his parents. How many times does a parent's marriage figure into the story of a rando? Working through. So I guess I've been... You know, I was going back through the the archives and sort of noticing, like, when did Verveke show up on the scene, right? You know, Verveke shows up on the scene kind of in the lull period of when Peterson falls out. And so here comes here comes Verveke, and he has this, you know, he's got this little box of fancy Verveke words, right? That's kind of the message, right? It's the... It's the the it's the the tickle me elmo of the year, right? Everybody wants the little box of of fancy for vacy words. But when you think about one of them, which is the psychotechnology piece, that's the one that you know it's supposed to permanently alter the way that you think, right? And you can't. Now I just did the conversation this morning with food truck Emily, and yeah, I talked about how in that video we talked about the psychotechnology of mass worship. So she's a worship leader at a major mega church in Austin, Texas, and she's very open. So, but, she, but she's on stage and she's on stage a lot and she leads worship. And so it was really interesting talking to her. And it's this psychotechnology was sort of one of the first things I picked up from Verveke. And I, Chris can't say it better. And do it. <laughs> it's permanent. And the, the thing he always uses. I meant to say I can't say it better than Chris. This is literacy. You know that's his that's his go to literacy. It's like you can't you can't think without thinking in liter like you can't do it. And so what I what I started to realize is that, and it, and I, I guess it happened to me, especially with some of these phrases. It's like relevance realization in particular. It's like it's part of the way that I think. Like that little that little bundle of fancy or vacu words is a psychotechnology, and it permanently altered the way a group of people think. And I find it very fascinating. For sure. And I'm and I'm kind of wondering, like, is it a good thing? Because then I'm thinking about we probably need some savings throw before all that. Um, <laughs> well, I I would say yes. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is that Christ says that there's nothing in the darkness that will not be brought to the light. So you could say it's all but inevitable that, let's say, everything that we, everything that we don't have control over uh, within our own lives, within our own selves, within our own being is going to come out uh, one way or the other, eventually. Uh, so for those of you who are only listening to this, uh, this is Neil that Chad has been working with a lot with these conversations. And behind Neil in his home office or wherever he's got this table set up where he's doing his recording, the wall is plastered with children's products. And he clearly has a daughter and he has some young children and you see hands. And, and I, I think the point that Neil is making here and the point that overall this video makes is that, number one, we are certainly colonizing each other. And um, John Verveke's 
language, his fancy Viraki words, are having a powerful impact. Now, they don't all have the same powerful impact. Some catch, some don't. That's sort of the Darwinian sifting that goes on. But, and I really like how Neil sort of gets human anthropology right in terms of this question about agency. Talked a little bit about a conversation between Chris Williamson and Alex O'Connor about the free will question. And I've never liked the free will question because I, I don't think there's anywhere near as n enough nuance in that framing of the question. I think Neil really frames it well here. And I, I mean that not so much in terms of our past, but in aspects of our personality. It's like if, if there's a gun on the shelf at the first act of the play, that gun is going to be used at some point in the play. Um, so when you're talking about not being able to take away from yourself those parts of yourself that that you've incorporated because of those words, because of those conversations, because of those things, um, it's an inevitable part of our journey, whether we like it or not. And we do have some control over the ship. We do have some. But in general, the ship in the tide, in the wind, is not in our control. It's the rider, you know, rider and the elephant thing. And the question always is, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about navel gazing within the corner. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing to do that because I don't see a big difference between that and say a daily or a weekly examine. Um, but in all of this, I think we still have a responsibility to do that. Now, some of you might know what an examine is. Uh, look it up on the internet. It's a Christian practice where we examine ourselves and there's usually sort of a, a rubric. Uh, Jonathan Edwards had a fairly famous one, has a pretty rigorous one. Uh, monastic traditions have these. It's a rubric by which we sort of have something out of outside of ourselves and then we examine our life. Every week at Living Stones, we have a prayer of confession and we have a period of silence before it that examination and in all the terms but i do also trust the hive mind i know that's a weird thing but we seem to be pretty good at when let's say a term enters uh like the latest uh i'm thinking of are, is uh malcolm and simone entering and you know, so we have we have a different uh sorry what was that monoculture yeah mm -hmm. so actually the the urban monoculture idea i found that real i think that's the single most useful idea that they've they've uh they, they are excellent critics and diagnosed they are they are excellent diagnosticians so i agree with pvk in that uh the but but my, i guess my point is anytime a new idea comes into the the hive making the the sense making apparatus the hive mind we are we are farming out the sense making to this this network you could say and from what i've seen over time and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, Chris, but over time, what I've seen is that the the corner has done an excellent job at separating the wheat from the chaff. Now, maybe I'm indoctrinated and I need saving throws, and that's probably true to some extent. Uh, but what, what he points at here, and of course, there are going to be some who evaluate the corner in very different terms, which is fine, because even if you're engaging in enough to evaluate it, you're working on this process. You're working on this distributed cognition. You're working on filtering this together. And again, some of us are external processors, and I've taken my external processing to quite a degree now, engaging the internet. And again, part of what I think has made this little corner special is we are really working on the scalability issue in terms of People need people to process things with. Now, one of the one of the things I, I try to give visib one of the things, one of the ways I try to use my channel is to give some visibility. And because Sunday nights are Sunday nights, I don't often I'm usually spending Sunday nights with my family or my wife is getting ready for Monday. But every Sunday night, Father Eric has sort of a, a Catholic corner of the corner. 
and it's not just Catholics on it, but Mark is usually there, and Josh is usually there, and Emma's usually there, and Sandy's often there, and Valerie's there quite a bit. It's it's fun to see Valerie, and um, I saw that. Where, where'd she go? Where'd she go? Sally Joe dropped in, and so again, this is sort of distributed cognition, and what's nice is that there's a little bit higher resolution to a lot of the distributed cognition, and maybe you haven't got a Randall's conversation yet, but you've got, you're on other channels. And, and so not only do we sort of have a connected mind, there are also, there are also smaller networks within the larger network. And that's been super interesting, super, in, it's been interesting to me in terms of seeing how that grows because you need the different size networks. Maybe you have this little cluster of Roman Catholic or at least Catholic interested people. And then you have some of the, the non-Christians over there or the seekers or, and that they're sort of all over, but you have, not only do you have a consciousness Congress with lots of voices and actual people out there, but, but they're in caucuses and coalitions and, and little groups. And so that's, that's super helpful. This morning, I just briefly caught Hezzy on Gavin's channel. I also have a hard day. Do you not notice someone else was having a hard day? And the attitude is, is I'm trying to give him tools that when he's talking to the other, right, already from a young age, can you put yourself in his shoes? Can you try to understand where this person's coming from? Um, obviously, it's difficult as a child. There's a lot of ego and, and a healthy amount of ego, obviously, in a child that's really thinking about himself. But, um, and this goes back to the beginning of the conversation, why I, what you were talking about was like very meta, which is like why I like this, you know, this, this little corner. And, and again, like I stress it by like, I'm not looking to join a church, obviously. And like, it's not like I'm missing like that right now in my life. However, having conversations like this, like these, where they could be, ha where, where they could be done in a loving and productive environment. I mean, I don't, I don't know how many other spaces you have like that, that which are filled with, with diverse uh, people from diverse backgrounds. Like, you're not going to get this in a therapy session. And like, uh, and like you said, Bruce, like you like bringing up an idea to also see if, it, if, it, if it's going to hold water, if it's, gonna, if, it, if it's going to uh, uh, yeah. hold up to scrutiny. So, you know, in a certain sense, like in a certain case, when you're by your therapist, so, you know, it's really your brain palace. Right. Like you're buying the time to be able to, like, you know, lay out your ideas and sort of play it with some feedback with him. But ultimately, this is someone that you're paying. And if he's a good therapist, he might not or or not a good therapist. It depends on what your opinion is, but he's not going to necessarily give you his opinion or his advice. But you're you're looking for something else when you bring up an idea. And I'll, I'm also looking when I have these kind of conversations to really, like you said, to see if what I'm talking about is nonsense. Am I meandering? Am I am I going in a loop? Is this is this? Is this actually productive? And I feel like productive conversations in a space like this, where you really do have like a global mind palace, where people get to just drop in and explore, I I would believe you you come out from these conversations uh, a little more refined, a little more sharpened. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Hezzy. When I when I see Hezzy on a live stream, I click on it. I. Whenever I'm on and I, I see a live stream and Hezzy's on it, I click on it. I, I, think, I think there's a lot of disagreeable people in the corner that do a good job of separating the wheat from the chaff. So, Well, I mean, this is distributed cognition, right? I mean, that's, that's, that is what it, you know, when he talks about what it is, that's what we're doing, right? The hive mind, right? It's, it's distributed cognition and... Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, th I agree with you. I think as a whole, I think the group has good discernment, right? Um, they're not bringing in, you know, ideas that aren't useful. And that, that's one thing I'm always, I'm, I'm always looking for, you know, you can make a model of anything, but if it's not useful, I, I'll, I'll get rid of it pretty quickly. So I, I I'll be honest, I haven't really paid a whole lot of attention to the Malcolm and Simone stuff. But I did pick up on that one idea, the urban. And and what he said right there is really important because, again, this is difficult for some of the really hardcore watchers to appreciate is that 
everybody is picking up on little things. I put out so many videos. I just put out a second one today on Miley Cyrus. Tomorrow morning, the John Verveke video comes out. That won't be tomorrow for you because this will probably come out tomorrow afternoon or the day after. We'll see how tomorrow shakes out in terms of making videos. But people are just getting little bits and pieces. And I put Malcolm on Samoan and a whole bunch of, ah, no, no, they're not my cup of tea. Oh, okay. Other people, oh, oh yeah, yeah, they're very much my cup of tea. Oh, okay. And, and because, I mean, to me, this has been so wonderful because I have one of the best seats to watch the corner. And so I, in some ways, even though I can't come close to watching everything, not close, but that's why... I use Grizz, and I use Chad, and I use Gavin. I use other channels that are sort of watching the corner for me. And then other people like Karen and Sam, they're talking to other people. So so Drew uh, Johnson was just on, and I want to watch that video for Sam because I've been interested in Drew's work, and it, Drew's work, and he sent me a, a message about two years ago. I said, I'd really love you to read my book and let me know what you think. And it's like, dude, you know, I got books that publishers have sent me that I haven't read yet, and I really should, so... Uh, good luck to you. If you want to colonize on YouTube, you better, you're going to have to figure out how to do this. But you've got all different people interacting with it with all of their only, all of their own salience landscapes. And then watching them and what they're interested in and just back and forth and back and forth. It's an astounding network. And if you can see it and understand it, it's astoundingly useful. What'd you call it? Urban monoculture? That's it. Yeah. Yeah, it had a uh, Tower of Babylon sort of feel to it to me. Yeah, I um, I, I actually still don't even know what it means. But And, you know, what he said in terms of the Tower of Babel or Tower of Babylon. Now, there's another great part in this video of Chad's where he talks about, Chad really drills into him about, tell me about this discipleship training program that you're doing in your church because Chad and Chris have both, in the process of finding the corner and Jordan Peterson, all of this joined a church and that's changed their life. And Chad, of course, continues to do his AA work. And Chris is doing a lot of discipleship with work with his church. And he's learning how that works. And so they were comparing notes, but obviously for me, the Christian valence is astoundingly, astoundingly helpful. But, but even as Hezi says, Hezi's an Israeli and you know, we sort of look across the way and Congress is going to have a vote on how much money to send to Israel and American troops are active on aircraft carriers and so, but Hezi's living right in the area. And so he's trying to figure out how to raise his children and, and how do you raise your children, not just with sort of these theoretical fights out there or these fights on social media, but when it's a hot war around you. And so and the Israeli project, I just find endlessly fascinating in terms of the, the, the rise of the observant. And, and so I, you know, I, I can listen to Hezi and Jacob and, and Yosef talk about these issues for a very long time because it's one thing to be doing all this Christian processing together. It's another real cool thing to be looking at the non-Christian stuff. Because then you begin to say, okay, well, this is kind of a Christian thing that this is these are the Jews working on this, and and it's a little different dynamic, but there are similarities. So, but so like, I'll, but like I was I was like that when with the fancy Verbeke words, which I think actually Job coined the term fancy Verbeke words. Which it was Job, which is hilarious. <laughs> but, um, with the there is there does seem to be a like um. Like we all kind of, like when the when the new when the new uh, words get introduced or the new language starts to get introduced, I like this kind of this uh, oh like we're like we're like a bunch of cavemen like oh I love this section of this this is my favorite section of this little, little clip. Look at this, it's a look at this strange <laughs> looking. You know, it's like a I don't know weird looking rock from like a oh look at this and, oh and then we're all like. Oh, oh, I like this one. And so it just kind of... It reminds me of The Gods Must Be Crazy, if you've never seen it, where this Coke bottle gets thrown out of an airplane and, and this this blissful little uh, this blissful little village is, you know, has a... is turned upside down by this Coke bottle. What is this? A silly thing. 
And we're like, oh, this kind of looks like uh, the four P's of knowledge or whatever. <laughs> and then, and then, so that is kind of fun to do. And, and I do think it's, it's actually working on another, I was talking with Gavin this morning, actually about this, about, so not only are we integrating like n- some new language, but we're actually integrating a new attitude, which I think is the more important tool um, of like the, the openness. So like we're. And I think Chad is dead on right there that yeah, the new words, they're cool, but it's the attitude because the attitude is what governs and allows all of this stuff to work. We're, we're actually, um, uh, developing the openness um, attitude, uh, which is is cool because like oh, and that that's where I, when I talk about play, like this is play, that's what I mean. It's like oh, like I'm not, I know I'm not going to go out into like my next job tomorrow and look at the new shower I'm putting in and start talking to the homeowner about relevance realization. You know what I mean? <laughs> gonna, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? Just right. put the shower together. You know, and or did you have you you know this damn urban monoculture? He's going to be like, "What are you talking about?" You know, it. But for us, it's kind of fun. We get to like, oh, this is this nice little shiny thing. It's like <laughs> nobody's nobody's taking it that seriously, except maybe you know John Berbeke, which is great. Mm-hmm. That's his work. You know, he's supposed to be. That's his shower that he's building. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. and. And so, um, I mean, that's why, like, well, Peterson, as you were talking about this, I was thinking about the different, um, the, the, the different um, artifacts that have made their way into our... Got to pause because sometimes I multitask. Our lexicon. The first one I, I really think was like... Um, it was two sided. The first one, the, the first, the one side of it was, it depends on what you mean by. And then the second, the other side of that was, so what you're saying is, and so that was two sides of the same coin that that was kind of the first toy that we started playing with is this, uh, this question of it, it depends on what do you mean by it depends on what you mean by so it depends on what you mean by belief and Depends on blah blah blah. That that phrase I've called it the lightsaber just for shits and giggles. Those are both because, disagreeable phrases, right? And and but it, it was a good tool. And then the uh, the flip side of that, which is the humorous side, which is very important, I think, is the so what you're saying is phrase, which is kind of like that's the lightheartedness of it, right? And so. We saw that, and then you know, we... and Neil pointing out that you have the disagreeable side, and then you have the lightheartedness side. And Chad lately has been really working on this because Chad really wants to keep it in terms of play. And I think, for, forgive me, Chad, for doing a little psychoanalysis here. Even though I'm, as a pastor, I'm not supposed to psychoanalyze. I'm not really psychoanalyzing. I'm just reading you because when we're reading each other, we're all inhabiting different parts of our consciousness, Congress. And, and for Chad, who he's an alcoholic, I haven't let any cats out of the bag because he's Chad the alcoholic. What he talks about it is if you watch his channel enough, he'll talk about this. He tends towards obsession and Chris's waves of obsession. And so part of it is, okay, we're, we're going to have to balance obsession. We're going to need something else. We're going to need some other opponent in the opponent processing to, to combat our obsession. So Chad often brings up just the play. And so, of course, John Verveke has this serious play thing, which, again, is sort of a built-in opponent processing balance. Now, John, in my conversation with him, also talked about tonos as sort of a, a, a tension, this holding some things in tension. Um, but so you've got some things. Oh, grab some Peterson that were a little disagreeable, but then we got we got the serious play, and so all of this comes together, and, you know, we're... I, 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 said, to, I said to Food Truck Emily this morning that... You know, I, I think about, did I say it to her? Did I say it to somebody else? I don't remember. I think about I, I think about this little corner as something of a distributed spirit. Now, it doesn't have, it, its body is distributed among us, but it's, um, it's definitely got, got a degree of 
distributed cognition going here. You got these other weird tools. You got the God number one and God number two. And then the flip side of that is everybody wants to give, like, have their own God number three. There is no God number three. <laughs> no God number three. <laughs> there's one and two. And God the Father, there's one and two in God the Father, one and two in God the Son, and one and two in God the Holy Spirit. There's no God number three. <laughs> so you have these different kinds of things, and they, they're helping us to play with all these different kinds of tools for fun. And... And again, like, am I going to, you know, in my day job or, or what? this is why I think the three of us had such difficulty and I don't know who I'm going to talk with about this stuff. Right. And like, if you listen, listen to all of the different rando conversations that Paul had, I'd say probably 90 percent of the people said I had nobody to talk with about this. It's like, yeah, because nobody gives a shit, basically, you know, like, um, it was really important for us to discover it, but not so that we know what uh, uh, the four P's of knowing are, or it wasn't important for that reason. It was important for something else so that we can actually understand people and, and maybe, hmm, maybe have like some, uh, uh, some, some good framework underneath so that we can actually be social <laughs> with people yeah that's what it is that's what it is right there because to be honest like i don't know you guys at all right but we've been talking for an hour and it's it's because we all kind of have this pseudo shared lexicon like this bucket of ideas that we can sort of latch on to and have a productive conversation of some kind it's almost like you just close the gap right it's like you said, you're not going to go talking to anybody about combinatorial explosiveness, right? You're like, <laughs> hey, you know, because <laughs> um, nobody they cares. <laughs> no, go yeah. ahead. No, no, it's just, it's just, uh, I think that's because, you know, when I was talking to Demir, I, I felt the same thing. It's like, I didn't. This was something, this was one of the big feedback points we got from Chino, the Chino conference, that when people got there, they didn't have to do small talk. They could just get right to where they wanted to go. And that is because we've been using these tools to colonize each other, in some ways to inhabit the consciousness, our consciousness congress, so that when we meet somebody, now it's not a it's a it's a virtual picture. There are limits to this picture, but in a sense, we can pick up some things right away and keep going and make progress along the areas that we're interested in have to explain everything you can just kind of like immediately go into the good stuff without all without all the explaining Mm -hmm. right right and then and then our attitudes grow in that uh, i've noticed anyways my attitude around conversation i've grown a, a little more of a confidence just in conversation in general and being able to float around with different ideas and and uh and and just in this practice, I can actually go out with my coworkers at, or or people at church or whatever and feel more confident in conversation in general. Mm-hmm. So it helps me that way. So, I, you know, I know I'm not going to use any of these kinds of words or, or even these kinds of d- discussions, but it, it's helped me to be a better conversationalist in general, which is kind of cool. Yeah, because, well, I mean, it's, Back to the cycle. And when Chad says, be a better conversationalist, you know, and when he says it that way, we just sort of frame it as sort of self-improvement. But I do see this, and I've seen it all along, what we're doing with the videos, what we do with estuary. Being a good conversationalist is a learned thing. It's a capacity. Wound up watching... Don't judge me, because I'm not going to give you the whole background to how this happened. Wound up watching a full season of Love on the Spectrum on Netflix this weekend. Boy, do I have thoughts. Love on the Spectrum is a lot of hours of... Now, they're you trying to use romantic love for this, which I've got a lot of thoughts about 
as to wh whether that's a good thing or not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But that show is all about helping these individuals learn conversation. And, and there are some scenes in that, I watched the second season, there are some season, scenes in that season where these, these people with significant autism get coaching. You know, ask what they like. And there's one guy, he was, he was the sweetest guy. He had a job cleaning up. And he was just, he was just motor mouth. And he, he was just the sweetest guy. I, I, you know, I, my heart just went out to him right away. And then I began to realize that part of this for him was a coping strategy in terms of anxiety. And he had just learned to talk, 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 talk. And that would help the situation. But yeah. So even though all of these three guys obviously are well within, let's say, normal capacity of conversation. I've just, I've watched Chad now for a few years and I'm much more interested in Chad's channel than I used to be. And I think part of it is, of course, I know Chad and part of it is I care about Chad. But part of it is Chad's channel is just better. <laughs> it's just better than it used to be. And Chad's leveled up in terms of capacities and there's no shame in that. I hope I've leveled up in the last five years. I loved it when Emily starts uh, food truck. Emily starts the truck and said, "Yeah, I saw the video and it wasn't." I, said, well, I forget exactly what she said. Something like it wasn't very well refined video. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but no, this is this is this has purpose for what we're doing. Go technologies, right? It's something that permanently altered the way because our conversation list in general, which is kind of cool. Yeah, because, well, I mean, it's back to the psychotechnologies, right? It's something that permanently altered the way that you think. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to say relevance realization, but what is relevance realization, right? You, you somewhat embody that and embed it in the way that you think. And so mm -hmm. then it's going to come out in almost every interaction that you have. Mm -hmm. But what chooses, I was talking... what's, what, chooses, yeah. what, what chooses what's relevant is my point. Right. Is that I, I, don't, I don't have control over what I find interesting. I mean, Peterson That's makes that point. It's like, how does, I, I have control what I do. I have some control what I do with, with that information that comes in, but. That's what Grim Grizz would call your land, salience landscaper. Mm -hmm. Named Salty, Salty Snitch. <laughs> I don't know, this guy's freaking brilliant. Uh, And then we have innovation in the corner. One of the things that Gavin brought on was conversations with his wife. So Gavin Palmer, 138 subs, has just a, I haven't watched a lot of it. I watched the beginning of it. I loved it right away. A conversation with his wife. Now, like many of our wives, you know, they're, they're tolerating what we're doing on the internet. <laughs> Some of them aren't necessarily always that happy about it, but they're tolerating it because, well, they love us and we're their men. And so then Gavin invited his wife on there, Wi-Fi and wedding bands. He's got a few videos with, with him and his wife, and they're looking out the window. And again, for women, this, this YouTube thing is a whole different thing than it is for men. You just got to admit that. So then Chad does the same thing with his wife. And they got the curtains closed. They don't have the window open. Let's see if they open it. Now they keep the curtains closed the whole time and they got their hands. And so this is another thing that's happening in the internet. It's a small enough community that there can be innovations. And it's not, you know, what is what is Mr. Beast doing to get more clicks? It's, oh, well, that, I don't know why that's good. I don't know, uh, but but honey, let's try it. And so, Ann and Chad. In the Friday morning game list, I'm Chad the Alcoholic, and this is a really uh, exciting show that we have in store today. Uh, as you can hear right now, my, my dryer over there is uh, going, so I don't know how many more minutes that's got, probably like an hour. Um, but I, I had recently been <clears throat> inspired by uh, Gavin had released uh, a conversation with with Kim, and they were talking about um, 
what it's like to be in a relationship and have uh, somebody in the relationship uh, have an active role in in uh... anyway so there's that and also today I discovered Charlie's little corner YouTube channel with all of 39 subscribers and 19 videos and he he's got a bunch of videos on here uh, I met him and got to spend a little bit of time with him in Germany and he I think jumped ahead of uh, Justin Wells and made uh, this little corner documentary. It's all of 12 minutes and six seconds long, but it's outstanding. I'll play a little bit of it for you and I'll leave the link below so you can follow it. But anyway, back to now and the future, the future is always unknown. Right. So in a sense that that what did you call it? The crest of reality crest of always, reality is always between the known and the unknown. And and um, any time that we take a risk when we're moving forward, we're stepping into the unknown in the same way that you're stepping from order into chaos and you have to see what treasures are there. And so every moment of our life, we're on that adventure. We're on that edge. But that there's another way in which that edge is is the whole idea of creativity, because that's where creativity lives is right there in between the known and the unknown. How do you become an active member of this corner without being proficient in everything that's being talked about? So you have some intuitions and you have some ideas and you can't just mimic or copy those at the top of the hierarchy. That won't work. So it has to be something way, way more, you know, uh, mundane or ba basic. Yeah. And I think each and every one of us has this spark of creativity that is, it has this, it's kind of anarchy. It's like something comes to your mind and you don't know where it comes from. And usually people don't follow that thought, but creative people tend to make that the starting point for something. Yeah. That's so beautiful. whatever so whatever that anarchy is inside you it can be <laughs> painting it can be writing it can be whatever that's i think the starting point how we become members of this little corner of the internet and i think every time i hear you say we i think it depends what we is and i think in that sense that's where i see this little corner coming to meet this moment oh that's a very i hadn't thought about that because so you, just let me make sure i make and sorry for interrupting i just want to get it instead of the we being it's like no no this little corner is a nexus point of many different christian groups and non-christian groups and that nexus point is perhaps the place we should look for as the thing that will rise to the response is that what i'm hearing yes you say? that's that's really good, Paul. And yeah, I think it's a good reminder to, for the people that are participating in this, to know that there's a way to also do this, just in general. I think in a way what this little corner has brought me is um, the ability to do more and more of this and to see the value in it and to, yeah, to carry that out. Um, so I think how that's to not how to not just walk one mile with your neighbor two miles. Yeah, it's that's a very beautiful. Christian motif, actually. Uh, if someone asks you to walk with him a mile, do it for two miles. If someone asks you to listen for one hour with them, maybe listen two. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's and in that sense, it's you. It's it's kind of sacred, actually. It's like how do we in our lives, online and offline, participate in the world that the world looks at us like, like a lighthouse. Mm. And that's, that's an image that I've been thinking about recently quite, quite a lot. It's like, no, before that I was like, okay, I'm a speedboat. I have to get out there. I have to, you know, go crazy mileage. 
yeah. <laughs> fast, fast, fast yeah, action that's based. And that's not how the world, what the world needs around me. No. What the world needs is like you stand there and you don't move and you shine. Yeah. And then people notice you and say, okay, thanks for the orientation. Mm. And that at times can feel utterly boring because you don't move. And at times it's life saving for other people. And we have to, or I have to learn to live in this tension of not moving and at the same time accepting that me not moving might actually be beneficial for those around. Yeah. Experience, especially if you also talk to other people and you can kind of see in your own life when you're on a productive path that sort of ennobles and enlightens you, or a destructive path. And I think it's kind of useful to think that maybe the dichotomy between those two paths might be real, you know? And, and because that also allows you to give credence to your intuitions about that sort of thing. But I don't, anyways, I don't think it's unreasonable to posit that since you're alive, adopting the highest possible regard for the fact that you're alive and that you're surrounded by other creatures that are alive. I just can't see how that can possibly be construed as a losing strategy. And so that's the first thing. So that's something like faith, right? It's faith, it's not, it's not only faith in your being, but it's faith in being as such. And the faith would be something like, if you could orient your being properly, then maybe that would orient you with being as such. Jordan, uh, Hall and I were both using the, 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 the surfing and sailing metaphors. Right, where you're trying to step outside of kind of a passive empiricism or... All right, so that's half of it. And it's really hard for me to shut this down because the whole 12 minute documentary is just that good. So you can find that on Charlie's Little Corner, all of 39 subscribers, even though I put it out on YouTube today, or not on YouTube, I put it out on, on Twitter today. It has all of 72 views in 10 hours and I asked him, I said, put some, uh, put some links. Okay. Put some links to the, oh, now we're going to have to add this little music thing to my video because it's on there and, you know, YouTube always pays attention to that. Anyway, yeah, that's what's going on. You can leave a comment. That's one way to play. You can make a video. You can show up on a a live chat, you can go to a conference, you can send somebody a letter, but um, don't just watch, play.